Hypocrisy I have never learned. I am in earnest about faith. I do not play with it. For Kepler, it was only the first in a series of exiles forced upon him by religious fanatics. Now he decided to accept Tycho Brahe's open invitation. Brahe, a wealthy Danish nobleman, lived in great splendor and had recently been appointed imperial mathematician at Prague. Kepler left Graz with his wife and stepdaughter and set out on the difficult journey. Kepler's wife was not a happy woman. She was chronically ill and had recently lost two young children. The marriage itself was no comfort. She had no understanding of her husband's work and regarded his profession with contempt. Kepler was married to his work and every tedious mile was bringing him closer to the great Tycho Brahe, whose observations, he devoutly hoped, would confirm his theory. Kepler envisioned Tycho's domain as a sanctuary from the evils of the time. He aspired to be a worthy colleague to the illustrious Tycho, who for 35 years had been immersed in exact measurements of a clockwork universe, ordered and precise. But Tycho's court was not at all what Kepler had expected. Tycho himself was a flamboyant figure adorned with a gold nose. The original had been lost in a student duel fought over who is the superior mathematician. And he maintained a circus-like entourage of assistants, distant relatives, and assorted hangers-on. Kepler had no use for the endless revelry. He was impatient to see Tycho's data, but Tycho would give him only a few scraps at a time. Tycho, he said, gave me no opportunity to share in his studies. He would only, in the course of a meal and in between other matters, mention, as if in passing, today the figure of the apogee of one planet, tomorrow the nodes of another. Kepler was ill-suited for such games, and the general climate of intrigue offended his sense of propriety. Their cruel mockery of the pious and scholarly Kepler depressed and saddened him. My opinion of Tycho is this. He's superlatively rich, but knows not how to make proper use of it. Tycho possesses the best observations. He also has collaborators. He lacks only the architect who would put all this to use. Tycho was unable to turn his observations into a coherent theory of the solar system. He knew he needed the brilliant Kepler's help. But simply to hand over his life's work to a potential rival, that was unthinkable. Tycho was the greatest observational genius of the age and Kepler the greatest theoretician. Either man alone could not achieve the synthesis which both felt was now possible. The birth of modern science, which is the fusion of observation and theory, teetered on the precipice 
of their mutual distrust. The two repeatedly quarreled and were reconciled until a few months later, Tycho died of his habitual overindulgence in food and wine. Kepler wrote to a friend, on the last night of Tycho's gentle delirium, he repeated over and over again these words, like someone composing a poem. Let me not seem to have lived in vain. Let me not seem to have lived in vain. And he did not. Eventually, after Tycho's death, Kepler contrived to extract the observations from Tycho's reluctant family, observations of the apparent motion of Mars through the constellations obtained over a period of many years. The data from the last few decades before the invention of the telescope were by far the most precise ever obtained up to that time. Kepler worked with a kind of passionate intensity to understand Tycho's observations. What real motions of the Earth and Mars about the Sun could explain to the precision of measurement the apparent motion as seen from the Earth of Mars in the sky. And why Mars? Because Tycho had told Kepler that the apparent motion of Mars was the most difficult to reconcile with a circular orbit. After years of calculation, he believed that he had found the correct values for a Martian circular orbit which matched 10 of Tycho Brahe's observations within two minutes of arc. Now, there are 60 minutes of arc in an angular degree, and of course, 90 degrees from horizon to zenith. So a few minutes of arc is a very small quantity to measure, especially without a telescope. But Kepler's ecstasy of discovery soon crumbled into gloom because two further observations by Tycho were inconsistent with his orbit by as much as eight minutes of arc. Kepler wrote, if I had believed that we could ignore these eight minutes, I would have patched up my hypothesis accordingly. But since it was not permissible to ignore them, those eight minutes pointed the road to a complete reformation of astronomy. The difference between a circular orbit and the true orbit of Mars could be distinguished only by precise measurement and by a courageous acceptance of the facts. Kepler was profoundly annoyed at having to abandon a circular orbit. It shook his faith in God as the maker of a perfect celestial geometry. Having cleaned the stable of astronomy of circles and spirals, he said, he was left with only a single cartful of dung. He tried various oval-like curves, calculated away, made some arithmetical mistakes, which caused him, in fact, to reject the correct answer. And months later, in some desperation, tried the formula for the first time for an ellipse. The ellipse matched the observations of Tycho beautifully.